can there ever be peace among people? There can be, but only through Jesus Christ. And in his church, he has removed the barriers between people. Find out how on this episode of Truth Trek. Welcome to Truth Trek, where we dive deep into the Bible to uncover the treasures there. I'm Pastor Jason Hubdy, and I will be your guide as we journey together into Scripture, God's Holy Word. A pastor I know told me of a family in a church he attended. It had started out as a traditional family of five. Unfortunately, there was a divorce. The children stayed with the mother who remarried. The father remained unmarried. However, something wonderful happened. All of the members of the family found Christ. After the bitterness of separation, divorce, and remarriage, all of the members of this family found salvation in Jesus Christ. Since the mother was already remarried, the right thing for her to do was to honor her new marriage, and so the father of the children remained unmarried and committed to his children. So my pastor friend told me that on Sunday mornings he had one pew that had an unusual arrangement. On one end, the new husband and the mother, then the kids, and then the father of the kids sat on the other end. There was a harmony among them. Even the two husbands were like brothers, and the kids had a love of their mother, father, and stepdad. To me, this is a wonderful and beautiful picture of how God has broken down the walls of hostility between those who find Christ. In this family's example is hope for all of us to get along with fellow believers in Christ as well. And that is what our passage this morning is all about. Let's look at a text from Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 11, and I'm going to read through verse 22. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is himself our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances so that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. It seems we are always finding ways to separate people into groups. In our world, almost no factor is out of bounds when it comes to separating people. If you have ever looked at the questions on a census form, you know what I mean. We're always categorizing people. We separate male from female. We separate by age. We separate by political opinions. We separate by race. We separate by income. We separate by talents and abilities. We separate by religion. We separate by intelligence. We separate by just about anything we can find that is a difference between people. In Paul's ministry, all of these I mentioned were factors, but there was one big factor that affected everyone in the early church, and that was the separation between Jew and non-Jew or Gentile. Ever since God's covenant with the Jewish people began, it seems there have been clashes between Jew and non-Jew. As the chosen people of God, the Jewish people were separated or intended by God to be separated from the world around them. 
there were a number of laws and statutes that God gave to Israel that were intended to keep them separate from the world. This had two effects. Some Jews had an attitude of superiority toward non-Jews. Instead of humbly realizing that the blessing of God was theirs because of His grace, they often became proud of their status and looked down on those who were not part of the covenant. Of course, this was not good for them to do that, and it caused them to look at Gentiles or non-Jews as second-class citizens. Of course, this also did not exactly endear the Jews to their non-Jew neighbors. The disdain was mutual because the non-Jews felt the judgment of the Jews and probably also sensed or understood the favor of God that was given to the Jews. We see these ethnic tensions highlighted throughout Scripture, such as in the story of the Good Samaritan and the woman at the well. The Jews looked down on anyone who is not a Jew, even those who were born of partial Jewish descent. Just like racial tensions today, these were strongly ingrained in the worldview of the early church. We know that children of people who are deeply racist carry those feelings with them until a generation rises above it and decides to end the racism. Even then, lingering feelings still hover beneath the surface for many generations, so race relations are not easy to resolve. Even when people have been born into a new life in Jesus Christ, their past attitudes can continue to interfere with the unity that should be found in the church. And this is what Paul is addressing here in Ephesians chapter 2. There was a continuing of the negative feelings between non-Jews and Jews. In fact, it was hostility toward each other that Paul is addressing. Nowhere has the hostility between Jew and Gentile been more apparent than at the temple. The temple was for Jewish worship, but non-Jews who believed in God could go as well. However, they did not get past the outer courts. In fact, archaeologists have found signs from the temple that warned Gentiles not to go past the outer courts on penalty of death. So this is what Paul is dealing with as he writes this passage. There are believers in Jesus Christ, the church, in Paul's day, who are both Jew and non-Jew. There is a tension among them because even though all have trusted in Jesus for salvation, some Jews have a feeling of superiority over the Gentile believers. They even have a slang term that they refer to Gentiles by and that is the uncircumcision. This was a serious problem because while the Old Covenant was for Israel, the New Covenant, the one established by Jesus Christ, is for all who believe. Not only that, Paul is reminding us that any act of service to God, such as circumcision, is meaningless unless we are serving with our hearts. The Jewish Christians may have been circumcised, but it was more likely done for tradition's sake. And in the same way, Christians today often feel a superiority to fellow Christians because of certain things they do, or acts of service they do, or uh, something else that does nothing to earn them more grace, but they feel that since they are more well-behaved, perhaps, than other Christians, they may be more favored by God. This isn't true because all who believe on Christ receive his grace. In fact, those who have committed more serious sins have received more grace. In Luke 7, Jesus gives Simon a lesson about this. There's a woman who washes Jesus' feet with her tears and her hair. Jesus points out that someone who has been forgiven much loves much. He affirms the woman and in a way shames Simon, who had looked down on the woman because of her sinful life. So Paul is teaching them that there is no reason to be separated by ethnicity in the church. Today, we have other walls we put up against each other. No church is without them. Someday, we will be part of that ideal, a church without walls of discord. But today, we still live in a broken world, and Christians still have a sin nature. That body of death that we are stuck with for now, so we see these walls up. We don't have a physical wall like the temple did, but we have them nonetheless. We need to heed what Paul is saying. 
Not that we have a Jew and Gentile issue necessarily in every church, but we do have many other factors that can divide us. So this is the first thing we need to acknowledge, that sometimes walls exist between us. We would be lying if we thought we were above it. We may not intend to, we may not even like to admit it, but even Christians sometimes put barriers up against each other, and that's too bad. We must acknowledge that none of us is perfect in eliminating all the walls we put up. But the next point is good news, and that is that the divisions were removed. Notice I said, were. Jesus has made peace between us, even though we may be too silly to notice. Verse 14 says that he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. So the peace treaty has already been signed and sealed. We just need to let all the troops know to stop fighting. You may have heard the story of the Japanese soldier, Hiru'u Onoda, the sole survivor of his platoon who stayed in hiding on an island in the Philippines. Even though the war was over and had been over for almost 30 years, Onoda refused to believe the pamphlets that were dropped on the island, urging him to surrender. He thought it was Allied propaganda. It's an amazing story. During this time, he continued to conduct guerrilla operations against the locals, burning rice crops, shooting at fishermen, and causing all kinds of trouble. Then he would go and hide in the mountains. In all those years, he continued fighting, even though the war had been over. Well, how many of us like him continue hostilities when Scripture tells us the war is already over? Jesus Christ is our peace. So here again is the Prince of Peace making a way for us to come to him and find our peace. The peace came at a terrible price. Verse 16 says the cross reconciles us and kills the hostility. Paul says here as well that the law of commandments is abolished. Let's be careful to see what he means here. Paul is not saying the commandments of God are null and void. The Ten Commandments and all the other statutes that God put in place that all men, Jew and Gentile, were responsible to live by are still valid. That's the moral law. These laws, the Bible says, are written on our heart. We are still to live pure and holy lives. What Paul is talking about here are those laws that separated Jews and non-Jews, such as dietary laws, and he is talking about the laws that regulated sacrifices. Why? Because Jesus had fulfilled that law, there was no further need for the sacrificial systems which the Jews had kept until then. So we would be wrong to take this as meaning that the moral laws of God were abolished. Now we get to our final point, that we are one. We are one in many ways, and I want to highlight them. We are one spirit, one nation, one building, and finally, we are a dwelling place for God. Let's look at those individually. We're one spirit. This means a lot. Jesus had predicted a time when believers would worship in spirit and in truth. That time is now. We, as fellow believers, live in one spirit. We have access in one spirit to the Father. This is through Jesus. This access to the Father is available to all believers. In Paul's context, this means that Jewish believers had no claim to any inside track to God that was unavailable to non-Jewish believers. Instead, all believers have equal access to God. Today, we sometimes think along the lines of spiritual maturity. Someone new to the faith may feel they do not have the same authority to pray, for example, as the pastor or a more mature believer. This is simply not so. All have equal access to God in prayer. Since this is the case, I think we should all be encouraged to pray more, bringing our thanks and our needs to God. Next, Christians are one nation. This is an exciting concept. 
Christians today often discuss the relationship to Old Covenant Israel and New Covenant Christians. The discussion often centers around whether the Christian church is somehow a new Israel or whether there is some special blessing to Jewish believers that is not available to the rest of us. Here in verse 15, though, Paul clears the air on this matter. Gentiles who become Christians do not automatically become Jewish. It is not that our DNA somehow changes to make us genetically Jewish. Rather, God takes Jewish believers and Gentile believers and makes them into a new category altogether, one new man in place of the two. So, we're not issued a green card to Israel, which allows us to hang around but not enjoy the benefits of citizenship. Rather, we're actually made citizens of a new nation. That's why he says we are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. If this is true of Jewish and Gentile believers, then it is true for all believers. So, whether we are African, Asian, South American, European, Native American, male, female, old, young, rich, poor, if we believe on Jesus Christ, we are citizens of the same household of God. And where then is our citizenship? Philippians chapter 3 verses 20 and 21 tells us, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So, our citizenship is in heaven. There, we will finally put aside any discord or differences we have now. So why don't we act like citizens of heaven that we already are now and practice what we will be doing in eternity? I pray that we could fully grasp the fact that in heaven, our stupid, petty differences will seem exactly like that. Upset about how another Christian spends their time or money, one day you will see how silly that is. Wish everyone could agree with you about decorating the building, one day you will laugh at the smallness of that. Hurt that your opinion or advice was not taken, it will seem like a minuscule thing when you are in glory. Christian, you are already a citizen of heaven. Someday your transportation there will deliver you and you will glorify God in his marvelous grace towards you and all who have believed. In view of that future utopia, our differences now need not stand in the way of our joy, our hope, or our service to God. Next, we see Paul's description of our being one building, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus being the cornerstone. That building is the household of God. Jesus is the cornerstone. Paul is not referring here to what we commonly see, a ceremonial cornerstone that is typically used, which has nothing to do with supporting the building. Rather, he means the stone that the entire building relies on for stability, as well as the alignment of the building being drawn from the cornerstone. Um, cornerstones in ancient buildings were the primary load-bearing stones that determined the lines of the building, and such stones have been found in Palestine. One, in fact, weighs as much as 570 tons. Christ is and must be our basis of all we do. Our house rests on him. It depends on him. The cornerstone in Paul's day would have withstood a flood that even could carry away the building. Our cornerstone will remain with or without a building and with or without us, the bricks that make up the house of God. All else can be taken away, but Christ cannot be taken away. Everything else may fall, but Christ remains. Christ is all in all. Finally, we are a dwelling place for God. This is a very exciting thing, and at the same time should give us a little healthy fear or reverent awe. If we are the dwelling place of God, that means he is in us. He lives within us, and we are built together for him to dwell within us. 
This should be further encouragement for us to live as we are God's dwelling place today. We are the house that God lives within. This refers to the church universal, Christians all over the world. All over the world, people worship in different ways, keep different traditions to honor and remember what God has done. If you look on a dollar bill at the seal of the United States of America, you'll see the Latin phrase, e pluribus unum. It means, out of the many, one. Our nation is, probably more than any other nation on earth, a place of diverse backgrounds. We have people as citizens from nearly every type of genetic, religious, ethnic, or geographical background you could think of. Out of the many, one. When the U.S. was founded, it wasn't New Great Britain or New Italy or New Germany. It was a new nation. The many people who came from all of those different places and cultures became one American nation. In this nation, we have elements of all those cultures. Everyone has a background, and it influences how a person sees the world around them. It means different foods, different languages, different concepts of what the family unit should be like, different ideas of the role of government, and different ideas about economics. Within that diversity is strength. The more we try to understand each other, the better off we are. We learn from each other and learn to appreciate each other. The differences should be exciting to us, something to celebrate. In the church, we celebrate a God who makes salvation available to everyone, regardless of these differences. Unfortunately, these different traditions and customs often serve as walls between us. Rather than celebrate the beautiful diversity found in the body of Christ, we tend to separate along the same lines as the rest of the world. It has been said that Sunday morning is the most segregated time of the week in America. And this is because Christians feel uncomfortable worshiping with those who have a different way of worshiping, and that is a shame. If only we could learn to understand what Paul has written here, that the dividing wall of hostility between us are already broken. If we could understand that, we could worship together in spirit and in truth. Isn't that what you want to have as well? A church that has no walls and no barriers between us? A church where you can worship in freedom without worrying about who is critiquing your worship? Every now and then, wouldn't you like to feel free to dance a little and raise your hands or shout joyfully to the Lord? All of these forms of worship are embraced in the Bible. But we often are so concerned about how it will look, or worse, we can't even put ourselves in the frame of mind to worship because we have these nagging little issues with our fellow citizens. My exhortation to you is that you would realize that you and I and all who claim Christ as their Savior are already citizens of heaven. And already, all the walls of hostility between us have been broken. We just need to realize it. We are, out of the many, one. Jesus Christ has removed the barriers between people. Walls existed between people, but the divisions between those in Christ were removed. We are one. One spirit. One nation. One building. One dwelling place for God. That is the present reality. That is where we are at. So let us live among each other as fellow saints in peace and love and all of that for the glory of God. Thank you for listening today. If you found this to be helpful or encouraging, would you please share it with someone who may enjoy joining us? Also, please like and follow the podcast on your favorite podcast platform. And if you have a few moments to take and give it a rating, that helps us out as well. Thank you, and I will see you next time on Truth Trek.